like a frog, to tell your name the live long June to an admiring bog. I challenged Downey, and I won the primary. Right. Then they had to find a Republican who would defeat me. Right. And they chose, the Republicans uh, chose uh, uh, Richard Nixon. The pictures you are seeing and the voices you are hearing belong to an extraordinary woman whose three distinct yet interlocking careers have touched lives all over this country and abroad. As a stage actress and a star, she made theatrical history starting in 1922 with the William Brady production of Dreams for Sale. She reached the top of the operatic world, singing Tosca, Manolesco, and Aida in Munich, Vienna, Salzburg, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and New York. And she served three distinguished terms in the U.S. Congress as a representative of the 14th District of California. In the House of Representatives, she was assigned to the Foreign Affairs Committee. She was a delegate to the Second General Assembly of the United Nations. She co-authored the McMahon-Douglas Bill that returned atomic power to civilian control. In 1950, at the urging of the California Democratic Party, she ran for the U.S. Senate against Republican Congressman Richard Nixon and was defeated in a campaign that launched the new era of dirty tricks in politics. Although defeated for the Senate, her campaign was a great personal victory of integrity. Since that time, she has traveled the globe, urging attention to all manner of pressing problems. She has been an inspiration to her generation and two new ones. Her name is Helen Gahagan Douglas. She's 79 years old, and in July of 1979, I had the rare chance to talk with her in her Manhattan apartment. I always have been. That you're what? An optimist. Yeah, you are. You are. You can see that in your face. Helen Gahagan Douglas, it's a pleasure to be with you, but may I, for the purpose of our conversation, simply call you Helen? Of course. All right. <laughs> now, I want to ask you, we're coming up to the fifth year since mm -hmm. Richard Nixon resigned from the White House, uh, and uh, I wonder if you'd like to talk about him. I really don't want to talk about him. That's wonderful. Why? Not at all. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Is it oh, it's too complicated, but we'll take half our interview <laughs> right. telling you why not. But the man, uh, he, he didn't hurt me, and, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm just glad to be free of him, you know? Right. I really don't like him. Well, I think you have some company in that. You know, I want to talk to you because we have such a fascinating life to talk about when you consider not only your career in politics and your career as an actress and your career as a singer. I think there's nobody in the world that has those three particular uh, major landmarks in their life. But I think a lot of people would be interested, as I know I would, to find out a little bit from you about your theater work. Because I think it's true that you're practically the only starring actress that never got a bad notice. <laughs> uh, you want me to start at the beginning? Sure, absolutely. Well, I always wanted to act. And uh, uh, we were a family in which I could have tutors, and, and uh, so I always kind of planned it, you know. And, but when I didn't know what acting was, I was acting in front of a mirror when I was a little girl, and making up stories, and dancing, and singing, and, and just making up stories for uh, uh, a half hour, an hour. Just that, I, that was the kind of what, the way I played house, was to make up stories, all right? And so then when I matured, was in my teens, and I went to a little private school, which is still there, Berkeley Institute in Brooklyn mm -hmm. on the Park Slope. Uh, I was very fortunate because I had a great teacher, Elizabeth Grimball, and she'd just come up from the South, and uh, she was the head of the drama department, mm -hmm. and just happened. It was lucky that way. I always had good teachers, and sometimes great teachers, and life is luck, you know? You have to work, and you have to have some talent, but also it's opportunity and being ready to take advantage of the opportunity. So anyway, when it became obvious that I really was serious about the theater, then it became a matter of great consternation to my father. Yes. I and uh, um, 
father insisted I had to go to college. I prepared for Barnard. Uh, you have to pass, at that time, I think they still do, you had to pass the board examinations mm -hmm. and you also had to pass special examinations in, in, in sight in Latin mm -hmm. or Greek or French or German. You had a modern one and that. And, and this was at Barnard in those days. This at Barnard, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And so uh, when I managed to do this, I think it surprised Father, and, uh, but he said, all right, you can go to Barnard, although he knew I was closer to the theater. Like a long story short, after two years working in the theater mm -hmm. all the time at Barnard, I would, did a, a professional play. And uh, I was seeing it, and I was, it was in the William A. Brady Theater. Mm -hmm. And he saw me, and uh, I hadn't been playing it more than a week when he asked me to come and do the star part, to read for the star part of a play that Alice, his daughter, Alice Brady, was supposed to play, and she didn't want to, mm -hmm. called Dreams for Sale. Dreams for Sale, Alice Brady. I should explain that, of course, William Brady and Alice Brady, father and daughter, were most prominent theatrical people. Now, we're talking, of course, about 1922, as I recall. We're talking 1922, yes, 1922. And Dreams okay. for Sale was your first big role. Well, it was only the second one I had. The first one was about a week, <laughs> 10 days, if it was that. And, uh, and it was uh, overnight I was made with the notices. And uh, uh, that upset me, because I, I knew I could act, you see. There was never any doubt in my mind that I could act at all. But I didn't like people to go on so about it. That made me nervous, you know. <laughs> I was afraid it'd make me self-conscious. And so it started that way. And then I went from when then he wouldn't open uh, in Dreams for Sale unless I signed a five-year contract. That was rather oh. an interesting evening. And uh, because he was sure that it, it would be a, I would be a success. And then I had to tell father. Mother was up in Vermont. With the, with the rest of the family, uh -huh. and I had to tell him about the five-year contract. He thought it was all uh, amateur stuff up to now, you see. And uh, he said, well, you can't do it. You can't do it. You're going back to Barnard. And so Harry Wagstaff Gribble, do you remember him? Yes, of course. I remember. Who wrote the comedies. Right. You know? And uh, he stayed up with Father practically all night, and I'd hear the voices down, two flights, <laughs> arguing with him. You see, let her do it. So then I went to the theater the next night, and uh, uh, Cromwell, who had mm -hmm. uh, been the producer of the first play, came and he said, Helen, it'll be all right, for heaven's sake, sign the contract. Brady really won't. He really won't. Uh, he won't, open, won't, won't, won't the put the curtain up. And he was a little bit drunk. Brady always got drunk, <laughs> made him feel happier at openings, which I had never seen anything like this and upset me considerably. So anyway, I signed it. And then when he, when we came out of the theater, which I uh, tell in my autobiography, and he said to Father, he said, aren't you proud of her? All Father said was, keep her decent. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, your father was a very important part of your life, yeah. and, and your mother both. And I'm surprised a little bit, uh, because your father, after all, was descended from a very highly individualistic woman, your grandmother, who mm -hmm. was a, an important figure in, uh, in Ohio politics, and, uh, and an early person to support women's rights. That's right. But he wasn't against anything like that. He was against the theater. He I didn't see. think nice women went into the theater. That was just very simple. Well, but I was chaperoned, taken to and from the theater in New York, from Brooklyn. And I, I didn't mind did anything they wanted me to do, just so I could act. When did you start to uh, take on an operatic interest and a musical interest? Because that uh, is what... Well, I... music was in the family. Mm -hmm. yes. Mother could fall out of bed in the morning with a high C or a high... Yes. above that, the D <laughs> flat, you know? She kept up her music all through her life. Mm -hmm. She sang, she had musicians in the house. And, uh, and it was, that really was the bridge that brought me to music because she kept saying, acting, you know, the night that I was there. I said, aren't you happy, Mother, about the theater, the good notes and so forth? She said, well, I would be if it was singing. <laughs> she didn't think acting yeah. was anything embarrassing to sing. And, uh, and uh, so um, when, uh, once Bambushek was at the house, mm -hmm. you remember the conductor? Giuseppe Bambushek, yeah. right. Giuseppe. And uh, I, I had the audacity to sing uh, uh, to sing, uh, to, to say, on Oz, to sing a part of a butterfly. Simple little role. That's right, that's right, from the areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I just loved, I thought that was lovely. It was such sad music. I just thought that was thrilling. <laughs> and so then he, when he closed the, the thing, he said, mm-hmm, well, you have a voice. 
I don't know who, who the teacher ought to be. I, I don't know. I just don't know any teacher. If I do find one, uh, hear of one that I think is proper for you, i let you know. And that's what he said to Mother. Mm -hmm. Well, then, George Sinofsky, Metropolitan, mm -hmm. his mother, and he had come to the States not very long before. They'd escaped from right, Russia. Russia right, right. Right. And um, so he, he called one day and he said, Madame Sahanovska is here. She was one of the great teachers in Russia. There's just nobody like her as a musician or anything else. She's terrific. If she'll take you, and I think she will now because she was taking, you know, anybody that come to her, they wanted to live, to stay alive. And she was the one that was the breadwinner at that time, of course. Right. And uh, so I went to her, and not thinking I'd be a singer at all. But just it was just part of the pressure of mother and so forth in the house and music in the house all the time. And I was taken to opera when I was a child, you know. Mother had a had seats in the opera, and I was taken beside her. And I remember one when uh, when uh, 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 the big fat one that was married to Gaddy Gazaza. Oh, Florence Alda. Uh, Alda was yeah. it Alda that was so fat, so That's enormously right. fat? And she, she sang. Didn't she sing uh, um, in Pagliacci? She did indeed. Yes, she did. And she rolled on the floor. You know, where she That's was. Right. She was. She was writhing with with emotion over her lover that she couldn't be with or something, or she'd just been with him or something or other. And I said to mother, "Oh, it's disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting." She said, "Close your eyes and don't look. You're supposed to listen." <laughs> You made a, uh, your first uh, plunge into opera in 1929. That's right, in Czechoslovakia, in uh, Marish Ostrova, which was the big steel town at that time. I don't know what it is now. And uh, that, that was uh, arranged by someone who was in the Metropolitan Opera House, Pavel Ludikar. Oh, yes. And he was the big Czech singer. He'd, he'd, he'd passed his prime, I would say, he just now. But he was the first baritone. And uh, he used to see George and so forth, and, and, uh, and uh, he heard me sing. And when he heard my, my, me sing uh, a Tosca at Madame's studio, um, he said, well, you're ready to sing Tosca. I'll arrange, uh, I'll arrange a performance uh, uh, this spring when we're finished here if, if Madame Sahanovska agrees. Well, and she was right there, and she agreed. <laughs> and uh, um, so that was the first. That's quite a plunge from taking quite singing plunge. lessons to singing. I sang Tosca. with it, but she was such a such a perfectly magnificent uh, musician mm. that when when you when she accompanied me, it was as if an orchestra was accompanying mm. me, so that I sang with the orchestra in the rehearsal, not the performance, mm. but the rehearsal, as if as if I'd always sung with an orchestra. Marvelous. Well, you sang Tosca with a with an interesting young conductor, I believe. Later, yes, in mm. Salzburg, mm -hmm. in the opera house there. But not at the festival no, time, right. out of the festival time, with Von Karian. Right. Yes. <laughs> he was very young then. Yes. So were you. Yes, but I, I think probably I was about eight or ten years older than he was. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that um, uh, to have um, sung with Karian in those days uh, uh, marks you as, a, as an artist of special variety. <laughs> <laughs> now, you came back after singing, you're making your debut in opera in 1930, and uh, David Belasco got you involved in something, I believe. No. Uh, um, Tell me I'm wrong. Uh, just before I went to Europe, mm -hmm. just before I went to sing Tosca, David Belasco, who was, I was under contract to George Tyler, mm -hmm. and um, I had begged George Tyler to let me out of my five-year contract with him, because mm -hmm. from Brady I'd gone to Tyler. And... Uh, it was finally arranged, but I did go back and do play for him, Diplomacy, the all-star cast of Diplomacy, while I was studying still with Madame. And um, the, the, uh, we sailed for Europe. Blasco sent for me, I'm digressing, just before, gave me the script at night and the other and said, would you please, I want you to play this. And that I'd never been with him. This was the play before. Tonight or Never, right? Tonight or Never, yeah. Right. And of course, in those days, to be asked by Belasco to be a star in one of his plays, it, it, people usually jumped at it. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I can't do that. Well, I said, first of all, I don't like the play. That's the first thing. I think it's pretty, pretty tawdry. And uh, no one will leave it. And, well, anyway, unless you have just the people right for it. 
it has to be the right man. He said, of course, but that's what I do. Always get the right person <laughs> for the, the leading man. And uh, uh, he said, uh, hey, you'll sing in it, and that'll be marvelous. People will hear you sing. I said, no, no, they're going to hear me sing in Europe in opera, the real thing. I didn't study all these months and, you know, all day long and all night uh, it, at the piano, not singing, but uh, in order to just sing a few songs and an area in, 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 in a play. And uh, so I went to Europe. And it was on in 29 or 30, mm -hmm. I've forgotten now. I think 30, 30, the second year that I went over there. I came back home and then went over again in 30. And I was singing Tosca in Vienna. I was alone. I'd left my teacher in Italy with her daughter. Her daughter lived in Europe and gone alone to, to Vienna. And so after the opera was over, everybody clapped. It was a terrible night with the wind howling and my train, you know, stood out and they talk about it in the, in the review, stood out black. But anyway, for some miraculous reason, my voice went front. <laughs> and um, um, I came into the hotel and the concierge gave me a cablegram. And then it said, it was for my brothers. And they said, if you want to your father alive, come home at once. Well, I went wandering the streets, and a kind Samaritan who thought I was trying to commit suicide or something, by the way, I stopped at a bridge and look, looked over a uh, man, who I didn't know who it was, just a stranger, said, Fräulein, what is the matter? Can I help you? And I said, leave me alone, leave me alone. My father's dying. How can you talk to me? My father's dying. Make a long story short, he took me to a cable office. I had no money, I had no purse, I had nothing. Paid for the cable, walked me back to my hotel, and then left. And I never knew who he was, and I was so sorry. Not to thank Never this man. Never told me who he was or anything. In any case, uh, I canceled all my engagements. Mm -hmm. I was to sing in, in uh, Yugoslavia at the Opera House and, uh, and a number of other places that were scheduled for Middle Europe. And came home. And for, on the boat coming home, Madam went back, came, came home with me. I cabled Belasco. I think, I can't tell father he's dying of cancer because uh, he didn't know he was dying of cancer. And I, the boys had talked to me on the phone so that I knew that that was what father had. He'd gone to the hospital for something else and discovered that he was riddled with cancer. And um, so I, I, I cabled Belasco and said, is your offer to sing, to, to play, to act in to I Didn't Ever Still Open? He came back, he said, of course, I knew you'd be coming. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I came home and father said to me, I don't know why you've come home, but I'm very glad you have. And so then I went over and I still wasn't very gracious about it, I don't think, as I think back, as I said to Belasco, well, you know, this will not be a success unless you have the right man to play opposite maybe. Because you cannot believe this love affair unless you just believe these two people had to get together. <laughs> and so... Uh, he said, I think I've done that, Miss Helen. He always called me Miss Helen. He'd watch for my first performance with Brady and watch my career. You know, he'd always come and come backstage afterwards. And he said, I think I've done that, Miss Helen. And he said, if you'll come to the theater tomorrow morning, I'll introduce you to him. I said, well, who is he? And he told me, and I didn't mean I had met Melvin uh, in Detroit. He was with the Bonstell Company when I was playing there in the all-star cast of Trelawney of the Wells. I was playing Trelawney. That was Barrymore's old part, Ethel Barrymore's part. Right. But um, I had forgotten it. I was forgotten. I tired that night, and I shook hands and thanked everybody for the nice party and the rest of the cast, and I left ahead of the cast and went back and went to bed. And um, so when he walked in, Melvin, oh, he showed me the picture of Melvin. That was the thing. He showed me the picture, and I said, oh, he's blonde. <laughs> I well, said, what's the matter with that? I said, oh, no, I, I couldn't fall in love with a blonde man. He said, Helen, Miss Helen, please. <laughs> and so I said, well, uh, anyway, he's too young. He looks as if he was my son. He looks so young. Well, Mel hadn't had a picture taken in a long time. And uh, so then we walked in the next morning. I was totally unprepared for, what, for the way Melvin looked, uh, his quality. And uh, uh, so we talked a little while, and then... Melvin excused himself and left, and Blasco said, well, Miss Helen, and I said, mm, he'll do. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I met Millie. That's marvelous. And Father came to the first performance, uh, no, the first time he was out of the house, came to a matinee, 
and he went home and he died that night, but of heart. Well, that's... Of heart. Well, he, at, at that time, there's a wonderful quote in your book uh, that he said to, to you uh, about the fact that making peace with your career in the theater. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. He said, uh, uh, I build bridges, Helen, you and build you character. I don't think there's much... And I see very little difference. I see very little difference. In other words, if you, if you, whatever you did, if you did it well, it was all right. Mm -hmm. It's a very fine philosophy. Yeah, yeah. Well, so it was Tonight or Never where you met Melvin Douglas and yeah. where you um, uh, worked together and then uh, married. We were married, a very private little wedding at home in Brooklyn. And uh, uh, we were living then on the Park Slope. Right. I mean, on the, on the, uh, facing the park. Right. But um, well, that was 1931. 31. And you're still married, which is a lovely still testament. Still married, yes. <laughs> That's a nice long run. <laughs> exactly. Now, you and Melvin are married. He has gone out to California for the beginning of a five-year contract with Samuel Goldwyn. And you make your first a trip uh, across the country. And it's a very important trip in, in 1932. Now, let's tell me a little bit about that. Well, I was exposed to the desert for the first time. And for the first, it was my first, first uh, realization that there's a hostile earth as well as a warm, friendly, loving, moist earth. And that one has to battle to survive in that kind of terrain. And then we went to Las Vegas. And at that, that at 32, the they families were breaking up in the cities. And members of the family were coming across the country hunting for work, mm -hmm. all of them hunting for work, young people, middle-aged and older people, fathers of families who couldn't bear, you know, sitting around coming back home, I have no job, and young people who couldn't bear the, the strain, nervousness of living in a family and so forth. And so we ran into them at Las Vegas and that made a very great impression on me. I just couldn't imagine what was the matter with the country and what was the matter with the Uber, mm -hmm. why I didn't do something. Because I was brought up a Republican, of course. My family came from the Middle West, mm -hmm mother from Wisconsin, father from Ohio, and of course, <laughs> no one ever thought you'd be anything but a Republican. And uh, I must say, that was the beginning of my, my doubting. And, uh, and it didn't seem to me, I thought he was running downhill, it didn't seem to me that he, he gave me, that he had any, had any sense of what was happening sufficiently to um, give the country what it needed mm -hmm. for courage. And uh, that, was a very, that made a very marked impression on me. Shortly after that, you and your husband uh, started out on a world tour. Uh, started out on a world tour for no good reason at all. And you know, <laughs> except that he, he'd gotten out of his contract, or Goldwyn had released him from his contract. He asked to be released and he was very generous and, and said, all right. He said, I want to be free to choose the films I want to play, not to be arbitrarily put into a film, uh, whether I want to do it or not. And, um, and I had just finished, I was playing in, I guess, The Merry Widow. I don't know whether it was The Merry Widow or something in San Francisco. And um, I, had, I had already sung, uh, no, tonight, it was. Um, no, anyway. 1933 we're talking about. I know, 33, but I was also a Cat in the Fiddle. Right. I was saying Cat in the Fiddle, and it was a return engagement. And it just never, never would have gone on forever. So Melvin said, if this ever ends, would you like to go around the world? I think this is the time we can do it and afford it. Because it was so cheap. Mm -hmm. Do you want to know what it cost? What did it cost? It cost for each of us mm -hmm. to go around the world, leaving Los Angeles, going all the way around the world and coming back and landing in San Francisco, docking in San Francisco, $750 a piece. That was for the first class any boat we wanted to stay as long as we wanted in any country. Now you'd pay for your fare on land, of course, mm -hmm. but that was everything that had to do with the boats. Incredible. And we could have our own choice of the boat or anything. Well, now that trip was a was a very important turning point. Very. You know, because you saw things in Japan and China. Speak a little bit about yes. that. Yes. Well, I saw um, Israel. Mm -hmm. Most important was was not not only China and Japan. I was where when we were in in. Uh, Shanghai. Shanghai had already been bombed by the Japanese. Uh, uh, it was kind of a one bombing and then left, but still, there had been bombing. Um, but what impressed me the most of all was in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. The difference between what was happening in, in Cairo mm -hmm. 
and, and uh, Egypt and then what was happening in Israel. Mm -hmm. And then Israel became the, the welfare of the Jews there uh, became a, a, a abiding interest in my life before I went to Congress, in Congress, and the years after that. Mm -hmm. So that was very important. Now, shortly after your return from that 1933 trip around the world, uh, in 1934, uh, you uh, had your one and only experience making a movie. Is that right? That's right. And the reason I had that one and only experience was I had turned down pictures. Uh, I wasn't interested in pictures at all. Mel and I decided we wanted to be t together playing, because mm -hmm. I'd been playing and then he'd been playing something else. He directed a play that I did about the Brontes and so forth. It was an all-star cast, too. That was a lovely play. Dan Tothrow's. But uh, then we had uh, our friend, Dan Tothrow, and George O'Neill wrote us a play mm -hmm. about the gold rush days in San Francisco and the great crack when the market broke out there. And uh, the Theatre Guild put on the play about the same subject just before us, the week before. And they had a better play than we had. <laughs> so our play, which was beautifully done and, 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 and set, I mean beautifully set and done and so forth, Mel directed it and we played opposite one another. And we couldn't keep it going, you know. It was all our money. Now, no one ever put their own money in a play. That was foolhardy, but we did. So right at that moment, uh, a, a, a telegram came from the coast mm -hmm. asking if I would do She. And so without, I had read She in my teens. H. Ryder Haggard's. H. H. Ryder Haggard's book, She. I always liked it, and I thought, well, they can't do anything to She. That'll be, you know, that'll, <laughs> little did I know what they could do with, <laughs> with She or anything else. And so I came up with a, t a telegraph back or phoned and said, yes, I would do it. Before she dies after a thousand years. What was interesting, you see, in the book, and I'm not going to digress about she, there's enough been talked about that, but was if one could live forever, what would you do with the time? Mm. So. It's not easy to live forever. It's not easy even to have a long, long life, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because in her case, <laughs> according to Ryder Haggard, all her wits were about her and, and she had her strength, mm -hmm. so that there wasn't the fact that she was weakened and was uncomfortable. But still, e even so, just the time, yeah. just the time that it takes, what do you do? And that was her unhappiness, of course. In 37, I decided to pick up my career where it had broken off when father- As a singer. Was dying, as a singer. Right. And to pick it up in Europe with the same, the same manager mm -hmm. that, uh, had, that uh, had handled me right. before. And that was the same man that had Von Karyan. We were his two, we were his two artists. <laughs> and um, so he arranged a tour through Middle Europe. I cabled him that I wanted to bring, I was worried about Hitler. Mm -hmm. Melvin was worried about Hitler. And I cabled him that I didn't want to be booked into Germany and that I wanted to bring my own accompanist. 
And he cabled back, and I told him what his name was. And uh, uh, he cabled back. It would be, it's inadvisable for you to bring your own accompanist. Uh, uh, you should have an accompanist from here. Well, we were suspicious of that, but not sufficiently to, yeah. to uh, do anything about do it. Do anything about it. Um, and I, I don't know uh, that he, he was a very likable man, and I'm not sure that he was a Nazi or was supporting Hitler, although, well, anyway, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Yeah. But so you say during that America. tour, right. let me start at the beginning, right. otherwise I'll confuse you and anybody <laughs> listening to us. <laughs> during that tour, tour through Middle Europe, I, I uh, again and again, the anxiety of people was expressed. Mm -hmm as to what Hitler was up to, what his military machine that he was building uh, meant for Europe. And um, by the time I almost came to the end of that, I was, I was booked for to be in the festival, mm -hmm. to sing in the festival. The Salzburg Festival. The Salzburg Festival. And before that, I'd been booked for uh, to sing in Munich. Mm -hmm. And I said, but I told you that I didn't want to go into Germany. They said, well, you have to go into Germany. Hofstetter said, you have to go into Germany before you go into Salzburg. You just have to have those notices, that's all. And at the end of the concert, which was successful, I was invited by Dr. Kerber, who was the head of the Salzburg Festival and also head of the Vienna Opera House. Right, the intendant of the Vienna Opera House. The intendant, Opera. right, to call on him at the Opera House. And I went to see him, and he, he said he would like me to come back in the fall and sing Tosca. At the, opera at the Vienna State yes, That's right. A date wasn't set, but it was agreed that I would do that. And I left there, you know, walking on air. Of course. That morning, and in re I had a telephone call from the critic in Europe at the time, middle European critic, who asked me to meet with a friend of his. N no explanation beyond that, but asked me as a special favor would I meet with this friend of his. My sister was with me this time. She'd come over from England. She was engaged to an Englishman, a newspaper man who was killed the first year of the war. In any case, she came over, and uh, so I had sent her on ahead to talk to, to this friend of the critic, because I said, well, I may be late at the opera house. And I was just walking on air, like I got over there. And when he got there, he excused himself from me. He was an Englishman. And someone came into the coffee house, you know, on the yes. left bank there, that famous coffee house. And he got up to us, and she said, now, Helen, don't you start talking, because he'll, he'll never say then what he said to me, and you won't believe it, because she, she was a, a Francophile, you know, she didn't think much of the Germans at all. And she spoke French beautifully, and she just didn't like their language, she didn't like their music, she didn't like anything. And she said, just, you don't think I'm prejudiced. Um, so he came back and he said, uh, do you know what's the matter with the world? And I could just feel my hair standing up on end, you know. I said, no, do you? And he said, yes, the Jews. And then he said what Goering, Goebbels, and Hitler said in those years that followed at that table. And I thought it had been hit in the solar plexus because then it seemed to me that all the artists I'd been with, those Austrians, mm -hmm. They, they had, there had been no criticism of Hitler, you know, generally. There had been nothing. No anxieties of what was happening right next door. Right. Because Salzburg's right next door to Munich, and Munich's in the heart of Germany. And, and uh, I thought, oh, they're all, they're all Nazi. And here this, this uh, a, a critic had been a friend also of Joseph Marx, Joseph Marx the composer. Right. I had sung a, a group of his songs every place, and every place I sang them, he accompanied me. And... Um, um, I thought maybe they're all Nazis. Maybe the only thing they want is to make sure they're going to get a piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. If Hitler's going to try to see what he can do uh, this time round for Germany in making Germany the key country mm -hmm. in Europe to the detriment of all the others, uh, that Austria just wants to be in on it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what I think is so. I think generally people agree that Austria was more culpable even than the Germans, more willing to yeah. go along. So then I came back to this country and uh, told Melbourne that, uh, 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 that I, I was not going to um, Except, return to, yeah. to Europe. 
I came back feeling, you know, he, here was a world I thought I knew, that I admired wholly, and that, that I didn't know very much about it. I didn't know anything about the world itself. I didn't know about the politics, the understructure. Only I didn't think in political terms at that time. Just that I didn't know about it. I knew about what I was seeing, the part I was working with. But beyond that, I didn't know, and it distressed me. And at that time, uh, tens of thousands of migrants from the Dust Bowl were coming into California. And what interested me and caught first my attention was the fact that uh, some newspapers said they were there and some said they weren't there. How do you mean they weren't there? Just that. That, that is a way, you know, who now with the, we, we notice with the, with the gas rationing, if you don't want to accept it and you're not going to, you don't believe it, you don't want to be uncomfortable, why can't you get gas? You say, I don't believe this shortage. Mm -hmm. You just wipe it out by saying it doesn't exist. The shortage doesn't exist. And so the way you'd wipe out any responsibility for increased taxes or anything, anything of that kind, uh, any sense of responsibility for these poor, miserable people that were fleeing the dust and the drought uh, and coming in hoping for some work that would keep them alive was to deny they were there, to use them and then have them move on someplace. So it was what happened in 37 that made me very interested in the migrants in the first place. The, 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 but even that was a slow, a slow uh, movement toward, toward anything that you would call political. It was a, a, a committee that had been set up called the Steinbeck Committee, named after Steinbeck, the writer, and uh, with his approval, of course, uh, to help the migrants. Basically, it was to raise funds in, in helping put men in the field to begin to unionize migrants, not just the Dust Bowl migrants, just people migrants, who worked, yeah, uh, right. uh, yes, day labor. Right. And they called Melvin about the migrants, the Dust Bowl migrants, and asked him if they could use our patio. We just moved into a new house and we had a big patio. And uh, because they wanted to raise some money for these migrants. And so Melvin said yes. And Melvin was working at the studio, so he couldn't be there. And I had, was, had just given birth to a second baby. And uh, uh, so I was resting in my room. And my cousin, who was our secretary, Walter Pick, went out to hear them, greeted them, and saw that everybody was taken care of. And he came in, he said, Helen, come out here. You never heard, you have to hear this. My goodness, these children in the state, and they've got pellagra. It's simply horrifying. So I went out and listened. So the next day, then they called and asked Melvin if he'd come to a meeting, that they were going to try to give a Christmas party in one of the government farm security camps up at Bakersfield. And, uh, and uh, they would like him to, to help on that. And in order to be with him, I went with him, just to be with him. And uh, in the middle of that meeting, they seemed to be having such a making it so difficult, the fact of how they were going to get enough food, enough toys, enough bread uh, for 1,000, 1,500 children, which would, what it would probably come to in the camp. Um, I said, I don't see why you make it all so difficult. I think if you go to the meat men and tell them these children have pellagra and they're in this condition, you've seen the condition that they're in, they'll all give you meat, it's Christmas. And I said the same thing with the bread people, the same thing with the toy people. They always have things left over or, or, or things that they think are not going to sell so well. And they said, why don't you just do that? Pointing to you. <laughs> <laughs> why don't you just do that, Mrs. Douglas? And so I became involved in that party. And that led to my accepting after that, a few weeks later, the chairmanship of the Steinbeck Committee. And that led to my being involved with the migrants and the being involved with the migrants meant that I became interested then in why there was a dust bowl. Why did they come? What was being done for them? What were the farm security camps? Mm -hmm. You know, who established those and why were they established? And one thing led to another. There was nowhere you could stop. Mm -hmm. There was absolutely nowhere you could stop. You had to go to all the departments in government because they were all interrelated, right. affecting the agricultural scene. And um, uh, and that was the beginning of it. And I always meant to go back to the theater and stage. This was simply a break. Mm -hmm. Never, never did I expect to, to go on. And didn't at this point. And did go back to the theater. Yes, indeed. Right after that. But then there came the beginning of the Second World War and uh, Melvin Douglas uh, overseas and the 
opportunity for uh, Congress, which was in, uh, in 1944, I Four, believe. Right. And uh, how, did you get, how did you get persuaded? Well, that again was one of those accidents. It was like them calling to want to use the, the, the patio for the migrants. Uh, Thomas F. Ford, who had served 12 years, six terms, in the House of Representatives, uh, who, who, who uh, lived in Los Angeles and was elected from the 14th District. His wife was his assistant. She was a brilliant, brilliant woman. She'd been a teacher. And uh, uh, he wanted to retire. He was tired and he was old. But he didn't dare retire. Uh, it was that they, in 44, it was very tricky for the president. And he didn't dare uh, uh, retire unless he was sure that the person who would replace him would be as, would be as strong a supporter of Franklin Roosevelt as he'd been. So we were good friends. They had known me because I was national committee woman and state vice chairman, and that was accidental. So then I worked with the women in California for four years. And it was then, during that time, that I knew Tom Ford. I met and knew all the congressmen mm -hmm. so forth. I learned all about politics and what goes into a campaign and so forth and so on. But I had never campaigned myself and always met with them when Mel went overseas that I'd go back to the theater. And so, uh, and, and said so to, to Lillian Ford when she asked, what are you going to do now? And I said, well, I have to wait till my term's out as National Committee Woman and State Vice Chairman. She said, oh, Helen, you're hooked. Why don't you do something that's really useful and go to Congress and let Tom retire? <laughs> so that's what happened. I finally did. And it was very difficult for the children, very difficult for them. Mary Helen, one day when she came home from school, called the Congress and, she, and they said, what do you want? I want the Roosevelt side. Well, they said, which side is that where my mother is? And so finally they figured it out and they got me on the phone and she, she wanted just to talk to her mother, you know, she was five years old. Well, it was hard on the family and it was hard on you, but it seems to have been something that worked for everybody. Well, I hope. I, I, I think I was a, a reasonably good representative. I tried. Well, we're going to talk about but it, that. But it is hard. It is hard. Of course it's hard. Yeah. And it was and you have, it, 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 it's, it's, um, you have to think about it all the time. In 1950, of course, you, having three terms in Congress, you did run for the, for the Senate. Yes on a campaign that has been described as the first of the Dirty Tricks campaign. Well, it really wasn't, because the first was against Jerry Boris, mm -hmm. when, uh, when uh, Richard Nixon ran for the House of Representatives and unseated Jerry Boris. It was the same kind of campaign as he waged against me in 1950. But uh, um, I, again, didn't want to go to the Senate. But I was so distressed that Sheridan Downey, who was our Democratic senator, was doing to the Interior Department what Joe McCarthy did afterwards to the State Department. That um, I determined he had, to, he had to be defeated, and we had to defeat him. In any event, the, the, the point here is that um, you ended up running against the Republican nominee. No, he ran against me, because we had had the seat. I mean, that's why I say it. I'm not saying it to be facetious. But uh, uh, we had the seat. It, a Democrat had sat in that seat for 12 years. Mm -hmm. For two terms, you see. That was Downey. Then I challenged Downey, and I right. won the primary. Right. Then they had to find a Republican who would defeat me. Right. And they chose, the Republicans uh, chose uh, uh, Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. well, and he was already in the House of Representatives. Right. But he hadn't been there as long as I had. And it was the campaign that, in, if not invented, certainly was a major contributor to the dirty tricks. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. They started with... The essence of that kind of campaign is this. To avoid the issues, you work up bogus issues. Mm -hmm. Trying to play on the fears of people. Because if you talk about the real issues, you may lose votes. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. That's an eloquent definition. Um, I want to ask you, because it's a terribly important part of this whole uh, problem that you dealt with, because the implication, of course, was that you were a communist or communist sympathizer. Uh, yes, they, 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 they tried to create that impression in the campaign. What, what do you feel about communism, per se? I 
think they've done some good things, but uh, I don't think there's anything, anything uh, that is comparable to democracy, certainly for us. I don't know if you can have democracy in a country where people aren't literate. I don't know. Um, um, but uh, I was brought up uh, believing that this was the only system, and I, and, I, and I still think of it as the system. I think it, it, uh, in, in, uh, that it is, it, is good, it, it is as good as we make it. That's a key phrase. It is as good as we make it. But the machinery is all there. And the machinery is not there in a totalitarian government. And communism is a totalitarian government. They have an elite in Russia. Uh, um, and you, 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 well, we know the story from Russia. There's no sense repeating that. Everybody knows it. And uh, uh, that no matter what, the challenge is this for us and has been from the beginning with communism. Or if, if, if Hitler had, had prevailed in Europe, would have been the same thing. What, what, uh, except I don't think it's fair to say that Nazism and communism are just the same, because no. I don't. I think Nazism is worse. But you were making By far point. worse. But if, if they had, uh, uh, the challenge from the beginning has been this. Can we, in a free country, in a democratic government, provide freedom and bread? All right. They provide bread in communist country, or claim they provide. And they have done quite a remarkable job in all those countries in providing bread, although it hasn't been 100% perfect. But they have pulled up whole masses of people who were suffering before. Certainly that's true in China today. Extraordinary in China what has happened, I think. Uh, uh, but that has been the challenge all the way through for us. I think when Khrushchev said, I'll bury you, that that's what he meant. He wasn't talking about bombs. I never thought he was talking about thongs. He was talking about, we will bury you economically. We'll pass you economically. And therefore, then there'll be no competition because you won't be able to, to, to do for your people what we can do for ours. Well, I still, so we still have to meet that challenge, I think. I think that's where we are. <laughs> you knew um, Eisenhower, Truman, and, and FDR. What, what was the difference, do you think, between the three of them? Well, I, I'd like to just correct a little bit of what you said. Uh, I knew Ro Roosevelt, mm -hmm. and I knew, I, I, I've talked with Eisenhower. I wouldn't say I knew him, you know, in that sense. And I knew Truman. Now. Now, the difference what, between them is... What is the difference between yes. them? To be, a very, to be a great president, one has to have vision. The founding fathers had vision. That's why our system has lasted and withstood the ravages of time and the stresses and strains that, that we've met in the world around us. Uh, Roosevelt had vision. I felt that, that Eisenhower and Truman were very good in responding, from, from, uh, responding issue by issue. But I, I've always missed the vision, the far-sighted vision. Where were they going while they were president? What do they think had to be done? What, what, was, what would the country need? What did the world need? Uh, and are we in relation to the world, you know? What do we all need? What does man need? The vision is very important. What do you think, about, what do you think about Carter and, and the possibilities of that kind of vision? I think Carter is very, very <laughs> intelligent and very good from issue to issue. I don't feel, I think that's what we miss, that he has a projection of vision. He has in the, in the human rights, you know, but then that's been around, you know, we, that's what we stand for, that's what it's all about in democracy. Um, and that's good that he expresses that. I'm not against that. I think sometimes it's not the appropriate moment. But by and large, that is good. But I don't, see, I don't see the vision. Roosevelt knew there had to be an end to wars. You know, and he can, he can see the four freedoms, his four freedoms with Churchill at the moment that they had that meeting in the middle of the ocean. Uh, um, the, the, the conception of a united world so that the world would learn to reason together instead of dying together. Nuclear energy played a very important part in your congressional life. What do you feel about the it? The bomb played an important part. Because, of course, I was, I was so opposed to Hitler and, and was so in support of our war against, against 
uh, Hitler. And that, that when the bomb was dropped, it changed everything. It changed foreign policy. It changed, war no longer became a, a viable instrument of foreign policy, which is what it was before. In the ancient days, they wanted to change a trade route, or they wanted to be in control of a certain area of the world, or a certain waterway on the world. So you, you, you go to war and knock the other fellow out who's giving you competition. And that's no longer possible. First of all, you can't knock the other fellow out, because you get knocked out too. It pollutes the earth. Uh, so, I mean, it, the bomb changed everything. But unfortunately, it didn't change our thinking. And so we go along with horse and buggy, buggy kind of reactions to a world that's totally different. We've gotten hold of the power of the sun. And we just can't go, uh, uh, we can't go throwing it around, the power, and we can't go throwing our words around that may lead to throwing around the power of the sun. I'm always very distressed when these exaggerated statements are made by congressmen or, 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 or leaders in, in our foreign affairs uh, um, or, or overseas. They're so unnecessary. It doesn't solve anything. It solves nothing. It just, it, it just creates an atmosphere where reason is, is um, impossible. I think one has to be very, very, very careful with the way one words what they say. And, and this business of trying to find a scapegoat for everything. You know, we're so beset at this moment with investigations. Instead of doing anything, we're investigating everything. You know, where does it go to? Where, 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 where does, what does it add up to? to blame someone for things, yes. instead of looking and saying, well, things have ch uh, uh, conditions have changed. What are these conditions that we face? And facing them honestly, being willing to face them honestly, having the courage to face them honestly, having enough courage about our own capacity. Mm -hmm. Important point. To, to, to face reality. Let me ask you, I, when you lost the Senate race in 1950. Did you have any desire to return to the theater? Oh, yes. I intended to. I always intended to go back to the theater. I never left the theater, per se. I never left opera, per se. And so I did go back to the theater, and I went back to music and sang and gave some concerts. And then, not having a publicity agent or any advertising, I uh, a request came in from colleges and universities and forums. They wanted to hear me speak, wanted to hear me talk. So I was stuck again with talking, <laughs> what I'm doing today. <laughs> <laughs> and, doing, talking. and doing wonderfully. In visiting the colleges and uh, the universities and all of those activities of talking, do you have a sense of excitement and promise about the next generation? Yes, I do. I certainly do. Do you feel that there's a certain realism about the way they are? I think there's that? a realism, and I think there's a courage, and I think there's a willingness to, to try new ways of, of, of living and new ways of, of, of um, earning their, their, uh, of living, uh, the way you live, and then new ways of earning their living. Um, yes, yes, I think it's very, they're very hopeful. You said in a Ms. Magazine article in 1973, we teach people to read, to be informed, but only in order to be successful. I think it's a severe criticism of our whole educational system. Would you like to comment about that? Yes. I don't think success, I don't think success is the be-all, end-all of life. I think to be a successful person, to be a fulfilled person, is, should be the goal. To be, to live up to your best, whatever your best is. I don't mean just making money. It, to be a success, what I should have said there, I should have added that be a success in money terms, monetary terms. In all of this marvelous time that we've had talking together, the one great thing that comes through in everything is your essential optimism about the human race. Yes. You are basically an optimist. Yes, yes in the best sense yes. of the word. Yes, I know, and, and, uh, and every now and then people say, well, how can you, how can you think? I said, look, 
you have to do what you can do. So you've only got a very narrow area in which to work. But you must do the best you can within that area. You must make the greatest contribution you can make within that area. And you can't do more. There's no sense moaning about the fact you don't have a great big playing field to work in. You don't have it. And uh, well, it wouldn't even be dead if you weren't optimistic. You stop living. I We're going to be dead very soon, all of us. <laughs> you know, <laughs> plenty of time for that. And I think, I think uh, extreme pessimism is just that. Mm -hmm. It's just that. Well, you, with the three areas of your life, all of which have been exciting and have given so much to people in the <laughs> theater, in the music world, and in the world of statesmanship, politics, um, if you had it to do all over again. Same way. You'd do it the same way. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I would, given the same circumstances. Yes. Given the same circumstances, yes. I would do the same. I would had to be. I was blown out of myself when world events mm -hmm. made, impossible, made impossible for me to simply concentrate on my work, on my voice, how I was interpreting this song or that opera or that part of the opera. I had, I had to think of people. I was blown right out of myself. And um, for some people, they could go on with that. I couldn't do the two things at once. Mm -hmm. I either had to do all, I had to be in public life or in the art world. Couldn't do them both at once. And yet they did manage to overlap. Yes, they overlapped. <laughs> <laughs> I like They them. overlap. <laughs> <laughs> I like very much what Haywood Broon said about you a few years ago when he called you the 10 most beautiful women in the world. I think it was America. You know well, what it was? Right. We'll limit it to America. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was uh, you know, they had a, a competition. That was why I did tonight, in, uh, did uh, Dreams for Sale. And he said, oh, let's finish the competition now. She is the 10 most beautiful <laughs> women in America. <laughs> I think it's America. I don't know. Anyway. But it's a splendid way of, of, yeah. uh, of ending our discussion. Oh, thank and you, thank Skyler. You so it's been a much. pleasure to talk with you. It's been a pleasure to talk with you and an honor. You talk to me, my father's dying. Make a long story short, he took me to a cable office. Mm -hmm. I had no money, I had no purse, I had nothing. Paid for the cable, walked me back to my hotel, and then left. And I never knew who he was, and I'm so sorry not to thank never this knew. man. Never told me who he was or anything. In any case, uh, I canceled all my engagements. Mm -hmm. I was to sing in, in uh, Yugoslavia at the Opera House, and, uh, and a number of other places that were scheduled for Middle Europe, and came home. And f on the boat coming home, Madam went back came, came home with me. I cabled Belasco, think I can't tell father he's dying of cancer, because uh, he didn't know he was dying of cancer. And I, the boys had talked to me on the phone, so that I knew that that was what father had. He'd gone to the hospital for something else and discovered that he was riddled with cancer. And um, so I, I, I cabled Belasco and said, is your offer to sing, to, uh, to play, to act in Tonight and Never still open? He came back, he said, of course, I knew you'd be coming. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I came home and father said to me, I don't know why you've come home, but I'm very glad you have. And so then I went over and I still wasn't very gracious about it, I don't think, as I think back, because I said to Belasco, well, you know, this will not be a success. 
unless you have the right man to play opposite Mamie. Because you cannot believe this love affair unless you just believe these two people had to get together. <laughs> and so uh, he said, I think I've done that, Miss Helen. He always called me Miss Helen. He'd watch for my first performance with Brady and watch my career. You know, he'd always come, come backstage afterwards. And he said, I think I've done that, Miss Helen. And he said, if you'll come to the theater tomorrow morning, I'll introduce you to him. I said, well, who is he? And he told me, and I didn't mean I had met Melvin uh, in Detroit. He was with the Bonstell Company when I was playing there in the all-star cast of Trelawney of the Wells. I was playing Trelawney. That was Barrymore's old part, Ethel Barrymore's part. Right. But um, I had forgotten it. I was forgotten. I tired that night, and I shook hands and thanked everybody for the nice party and the rest of the cast, and I left ahead of the cast and went back and went to bed. And um, so when he walked in, Melvin, oh, he showed me the picture of Melvin. That was the thing. He showed me the picture, and I said, oh, he's blonde. <laughs> well, he said, what's the matter with that? I said, oh, no, I, I couldn't fall in love with a blonde man. He said, Helen, Miss Helen, please. <laughs> and so I said, well, uh, anyway, he's too young. He looks as if he was my son. He looks so young. Well, Mel hadn't had a picture taken in a long time. And uh, so then we walked in the next morning. I was totally unprepared for what, for the way Melvin looked, uh, his quality. And uh, uh, so we talked a little while, and then Melvin excused himself and left. And Blasco said, well, Miss Helen. I said, mm, he'll do. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I met Millie. That's marvelous. And father came to the first performance. Uh, no, the first time he was out of the house, came to a matinee, and he went home and he died that night, but of heart. Well, that's of heart. Well, he at at that time there's a wonderful quote in your book uh, that he said to, to you uh, about the fact that making peace with your career in the theater. Oh yes, yes, yeah. He said. Uh, uh, I build bridges, Helen. You and build you. character. I don't think there's much. And I see very little difference. I see very little difference. In other words, if you, if you, whatever you did, if you did it well, it was all right. Mm -hmm. It's a very fine philosophy. Yeah, yeah. Well, so it was tonight or never where you met Melvin Douglas and yeah. where you um, uh, worked together and then uh, married. We were married, a very private little wedding at home in Brooklyn, and. Uh, uh, we were living then on the park slope. Right. I mean, on the on the uh, facing the park. Mm, right. But well, that was 1931. If I 31. And you're still married, which is a lovely still testament. Still married, yes. <laughs> That's a nice long run. <laughs> exactly. Now, you and Melvin are married. He has gone out to California for the beginning of a five-year contract with Samuel Goldwyn, and you make your first a trip. Uh, across the country, and it's a very important trip in, in 1932. Now, let's tell me a little bit about that. Well, I was exposed to the desert for the first time. And for the first, it was my first, first uh, realization that there's a hostile earth as well as a warm, friendly, loving, moist earth, and that one has to battle to survive in that kind of terrain. And then we went to Las Vegas, and at that, that at 32, they, they, Families were breaking up in the cities, mm -hmm. and members of the family were coming across the country hunting for work, mm -hmm. all of them hunting for work, young people, middle-aged, and older people, fathers of families who couldn't bear, you know, sitting around coming back home, I have no job, and young people who couldn't bear the, the strain, nervousness of living in a family, and so forth. And so we ran into them at Las Vegas, and that made a very great impression on me. I just couldn't imagine what was the matter with the country and what was the matter with Uber, mm -hmm. why I didn't do something, because I was brought up a Republican, of course. My family came from the Middle West, mm -hmm. mother from Wisconsin, father from Ohio, and of course, no one ever thought you'd be anything but a Republican. And uh, I must say, that was the beginning of my, my doubting. And, uh, and it didn't seem to me, I thought he was running downhill, it didn't seem to me that he, he gave me, that he had any, had any sense of what was happening mm -hmm. sufficiently to um, give the country what it needed mm -hmm. for courage. And. Uh, and that was a very that made a very marked impression on me. Shortly after that, you and your husband uh, started out on a world tour. 
uh, start which, out a world war for no good reason at all. And you know, <laughs> except that he he had gotten out of his contract. Or Goldwyn had released him from his contract. He asked to be released, and he was very generous and and said, "All right." He said, "I want to be free to choose the films I want to play, not to be arbitrarily put into a film, uh, whether I want to do it or not." And um, and I had just finished. I was playing in. I guess the Merry Widow. I don't know whether it was the Merry Widow or something in San Francisco, and um, I had of... I had already sung. Uh, no, tonight it was. Um, no, but anyway. 1933. We're talking about. I know 33, but I was also the Cat and the Fiddle. Right. I was singing Cat and the Fiddle, and it was a return engagement, and it just never, never would have gone on forever. So Melvin said, "If this ever ends, would you like to go around the world? I think this is the time we can do it and afford it, because it was so cheap." Mm -hmm. Do you want to know what it cost? What did it cost? It cost for each of us mm -hmm. to go around the world, leaving Los Angeles, going all the way around the world, and coming back and landing in San Francisco, docking in San Francisco, $750 a piece. That was for the first class, any boat we wanted, to stay as long as we wanted in any country. Now, you'd pay for your fare yeah. on land, of mm -hmm. course, but that was everything that had to do with the boats. Incredible. And we could have our own choice of the boat or anything. Well, now that trip was a was a very important turning point. Very, you know, because you saw things in Japan and China. Speak a little bit about yes, that. Yes. Well, I saw um, Israel. Mm -hmm. Most important was was not not only China and Japan. I was where when we were in in uh, Shanghai. Shanghai had already been bombed by the Japanese. Uh, uh, it was kind of a one bombing and then left. But still, there had been bombing. Um, but what impressed me the most of all was in the Middle East, mm -hmm. the difference between what was happening in, in Cairo mm -hmm. and, and uh, Egypt and then what was happening in Israel. Mm -hmm. And then Israel became the, the welfare of the Jews there, uh, became a, a, a abiding interest mm -hmm. in my life before I went to Congress, in Congress, and the years after that. Mm -hmm. So that was very important. Now, shortly after your return from that 1933 trip around the world, uh, in 1934, uh, you uh, had your one and only experience making a movie. Is that right? That's right. And the reason I had that one and only experience was I had turned down pictures. Uh, I wasn't interested in pictures at all. Mel and I decided we wanted to be t together playing, because I'd been playing and then he'd been playing something else. He directed a play that I did about the Brontes and so forth. It was an all-star cast, too. That was a lovely play. Dan Tothrow's. But uh, then we had uh, our friend, Dan Tothrow, and George O'Neill wrote us a play mm -hmm. about the gold rush days in San Francisco and the great crack when the market broke out there. And. Uh, the Theatre Guild put on the play about the same subject just before us, the week before. And they had a better play than we had. <laughs> so our play, which was beautifully done and, 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 and set, I mean beautifully set and done and so forth, Mel directed it and we played opposite one another. And we couldn't keep it going, you know. It was all our money. Now, no one ever put their own money <laughs> in a play. That was foolhardy, but we did. So right at that moment, uh, uh, a uh, telegram came from the coast mm -hmm. asking if I would do She. And so without, I had read She in my teens. H. Ryder Haggard's H. H. Ryder Haggard's book, She. I always liked it, and I thought, well, they can't do anything to She. That'll be, you know, <laughs> little did I know what they could do with, <laughs> with She or anything else. And so I came up with a, t a telegraph back or phoned and said, yes, I would do it. to tell your name the livelong June to an admiring bog. I challenged Downey, and I won the primary. Right. Then they had to find a Republican 
who would defeat me. Right. And they chose, the Republicans uh, chose uh, uh, Richard Nixon. The pictures you are seeing and the voices you are hearing belong to an extraordinary woman whose three distinct yet interlocking careers have touched lives all over this country and abroad. As a stage actress and a star, she made theatrical history starting in 1922 with the William Brady production of Dreams for Sale. She reached the top of the operatic world, singing Tosca, Manolesco, and Aida in Munich, Vienna, Salzburg, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and New York. And she served three distinguished terms in the U.S. Congress as a representative of the 14th District of California. In the House of Representatives, she was assigned to the Foreign Affairs Committee. She was a delegate to the Second General Assembly of the United Nations. She co-authored the McMahon-Douglas Bill that returned atomic power to civilian control. In 1950, at the urging of the California Democratic Party, she ran for the U.S. Senate against Republican Congressman Richard Nixon and was defeated in a campaign that launched the new era of dirty tricks in politics. Although defeated for the Senate, her campaign was a great personal victory of integrity. Since that time, she has traveled the globe, urging attention to all manner of pressing problems. She has been an inspiration to her generation and two new ones. Her name is Helen Gahagan Douglas. She's 79 years old, and in July of 1979, I had the rare chance to talk with her in her Manhattan apartment. I always have been. That you're what? An optimist. Yeah, you are. You are. No. You can see that in your face. Helen Gahagan Douglas, it's a pleasure to be with you, but may I, for the purpose of our conversation, simply call you Helen? Of course. All right. <laughs> now, I want to ask you, we're coming up to the fifth year since Richard Nixon resigned from the White House. Uh, and uh, I wonder if you'd like to talk about him. I really don't want to talk about him. That's wonderful. Why? Not at all. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Is it oh, it's too complicated, but we'll take half our interview <laughs> right. telling you why not. But the man, uh, he, he didn't hurt me, and, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm just glad to be free of him, you know? Right. I really don't like him. Well, I think you have some company in that. You know, I want to talk to you because we have such a fascinating life to talk about when you consider not only your career in politics and your career as an actress and your career as a singer, I think there's nobody in the world that has those three particular uh, major landmarks in their life. But I think a lot of people would be interested, as I know I would, to find out a little bit from you about your theater work. Because I think it is true that you're practically the only starring actress that never got a bad notice. <laughs> uh you want me to start at the beginning? Sure, absolutely. Well, I always wanted to act. And uh, uh, we were a family in which I could have tutors, and, and uh, so I always kind of planned it, you know. And, but when I didn't know what acting was, I was acting in front of a mirror when I was a little girl. And making up stories, and dancing, and singing, and, and just making up stories for uh, uh, a half hour, an hour. Just that, I, that was the kind of what, the way I played house was to make up stories, all right? And so then when I matured, was in my teens, and I went to a little private school, which is still there, Berkeley Institute in Brooklyn on the Park Slope, uh, I was very fortunate because I had a great teacher, Elizabeth Grimball, and she'd just come up from the South, and uh, she was the head of the drama department, and just happened, it was lucky that way. I always had good teachers, and sometimes great teachers. And life is luck, you know? You have to work, and you have to have some talent, but also it's opportunity, and being ready to take advantage of the opportunity. So anyway, when it became obvious that I really was serious about the theater, then it became a matter of great consternation to my father. Yes. I and uh, um, father insisted I had to go to college. I prepared for Barnard, 
uh, you have to pass, you, at that time, I think they still do, you had to pass the board examinations mm -hmm. and you also had to pass special examinations in, in, in sight, in Latin mm -hmm. or Greek or French or German. You had a modern one in that. And, and, this was at Barnard in those days. This at Barnard, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. And so uh, when I managed to do this, I think it surprised Father, and, uh, but he said, all right, you can go to Barnard, although he knew I was closer to the theater. Like a long story short, after two years working in the theater mm -hmm. all the time at Barnard, I would, did a, a professional play. And uh, I was seen it, and I was, it was in the William A. Brady Theater. Mm -hmm. And he saw me, and uh, I hadn't been playing it more than a week when he asked me to come and do the star part, to read for the star part of a play that Alice, his daughter, Alice Brady, was supposed to play, and she didn't want to, mm -hmm. called Dreams for Sale. Dreams for Sale. Alice Brady, mm -hmm. I should explain that, of course, William Brady and Alice Brady, father and daughter, were most prominent theatrical people. Now, we're talking, of course, about 1922, as I recall. We're talking 1922, yes, 1922. And Dreams okay. for Sale was your first big role. Well, it was only the second one I had. The first one was about a week, <laughs> 10 days, if it was that. And, uh, and it was uh, overnight I was made with the notices. And uh, uh, that upset me, because I, I knew I could act, you see. There was mm. never any doubt in my mind that I could act at all. But I didn't like people to go on so about it. That made me nervous, you know. I was afraid it would make me self-conscious. And so it started that way. And then I went from when then he wouldn't open uh, in Dreams for Sale unless I signed a five-year contract. That was rather uh -huh. an interesting evening. And uh, because he was sure that it, it would be a, I would be a success. And then I had to tell father. Mother was up in Vermont. With the, with the rest of the family, mm -hmm. and I had to tell him about the five-year contract. He thought it was all uh, amateur stuff up to now, you see. And uh, he said, well, you can't do it. This, you can't do it. You're going back to Barnard. And so Harry Wagstaff Gribble, do you remember him? Yes, of course. I'm... Who wrote the comedies. Right. You know? And uh, he stayed up with Father practically all night, and I'd hear the voices down, two flights, <laughs> <laughs> arguing with him you see, let her do it. So then I went to the theater the next night and uh, uh, Cromwell, who had mm -hmm. uh, been the producer of the first play, came and he said, Helen, it'll be all right for heaven's sake, sign the contract. Brady really won't. He really won't. Uh, he won't, open, won't, won't, won't put, the put the curtain up. And he was a little bit drunk. Brady always got drunk, it made him feel happier at openings, which I had never seen anything like this and upset me considerably. So anyway, I signed it. And then when he, when we came out of the theater, which I uh, tell in my autobiography, and he said to Father, he said, aren't you proud of her? All Father said was, keep her decent. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, your father was a very important part of your life, yeah. and, and your mother both. And I'm surprised a little bit, uh, because your father, after all, was descended from a very highly individualistic woman, your grandmother, who mm -hmm. was a, an important figure in, uh, in Ohio politics and, uh, and an early person to support women's rights. Right. But he wasn't against anything like that. He was against the theater. He I didn't see. think nice women went into the theater. That was just very simple. Well, I was chaperoned, taken to and from the theater in New York, from Brooklyn. And I, I didn't mind did anything they wanted me to do, just so I could act. When did you start to uh, take on an operatic interest and a musical interest? Because that uh, is what... Well, music was in the family. Mm -hmm. Mother could fall out of bed in the morning with a high C or a high... Yes. above that, the D <laughs> flat, you know. She kept up her music all through her life. She sang, she had musicians in the house. And, uh, and it was, that really was the bridge that brought me to music, because she kept saying, acting, you know, the night that I was there. I said, aren't you happy, Mother, about the theater, the good notes, and so forth. She said, well, I would be if it was singing. <laughs> she didn't think acting yeah. was anything embarrassing to singing. And, uh, and uh, so, uh, when, uh, once Bambushek was at the house, mm -hmm. you remember the conductor? Giuseppe Bambushek, yeah. right. Yeah, Giuseppe. And uh, I, I had the audacity to sing uh, uh, to sing, uh, to, to say, on Oz, to sing a part of a butterfly. Simple little role. That's right, that's right, from the areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I just loved, I thought that was lovely. It was such sad music. I just thought that was thrilling. <laughs> and so then he, when he closed the, the thing, he said, mm-hmm, well, you have a voice. 
I don't know who, who the teacher ought to be. I, I don't know. I just don't know any teacher. If I do find one, uh, hear of one that I think is proper for you, I'll let you know. And that's what he said to mother. Mm -hmm. Well, then, George Sinofsky, Metropolitan, mm -hmm. his mother, and he had come to the States not very long before. They'd escaped from right, Russia. Russia right. 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 And um, so he, he called one day and he said, Madame Sahanovska is here. She was one of the great teachers in Russia. There's just nobody like her as a musician or anything else. She's terrific. If she'll take you, and I think she will now because she was taking, you know, anybody that come to her, they want to live, to stay alive. And she was the one that was the breadwinner at that time, of course. Right. And uh, so I went to her, and not thinking I'd be a singer at all. But just, it was just part of the pressure of mother and so forth in the house and music in the house all the time. And I was taken to opera when I was a child, you know. Mother had, a, had seats in the opera and I was taken beside her. And I remember one when, uh, when uh, 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 the big fat one that was married to Gaddy Kazaza. Oh, Florence Alda? Uh, Alda. Was yeah. it Alda that was so fat, so That's enormously right. fat? And she, she sang, didn't she sing uh, um, in Pagliacci? She did indeed. Yes, she did. And she rolled on the floor, you know, where she, was, right. she, was, she was writhing with, with emotion over her lover that she couldn't be with or something, or she'd just been with him or something or other. And I said to mother, oh, it's disgusting. It's absolutely disgusting. She said, close your eyes and don't look. You're supposed to listen. <laughs> You made a, uh, your first uh, plunge into opera in 1929. That's right, in Czechoslovakia, in uh, Marish Ostrova, which was the big steel town at that time. I don't know what it is now. And uh, that, that was uh, arranged by someone who was in the Metropolitan Opera House, Pavel Ludikar. Oh, yes. And he was the big Czech singer. He, he, he passed his prime, I would say, he just now. But he was the first baritone. And uh, he used to see George and so forth. And, and, uh, and uh, he heard me sing. And when he heard my, my, me sing uh, Tosca at Madame's studio, um, he said, well, you're ready to sing Tosca. I'll arrange, uh, I'll arrange a performance uh, uh, this spring when we're finished here. If, if Madame Sahanovska agrees. Well, and she was right there and she agreed. <laughs> and uh, um, so that was the first. Mm -hmm. That's quite a plunge from taking quite singing lessons to singing I sang Tosca. with it, well, she was such a, such a perfectly magnificent uh, musician mm -hmm. that when, when, you, when she accompanied me, it was as if an orchestra was accompanying mm -hmm. me. So that I sang with the orchestra in the rehearsal, not the performance, mm -hmm. but the rehearsal, as if, as if I'd always sung with an orchestra. Marvelous. Well, you sang Tosca with, a, with an interesting young conductor, I believe. Later, yes, in mm -hmm. Salzburg, mm -hmm. in the opera house there, but not at the festival no, time, right. out of the festival time, with Von Karian. Right. Yes. He was very young then. <laughs> yes. So were you. Yes, but I, I think probably I was about eight or ten years older than he was. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that um, uh, to have um, sung with Karyan in those days uh, uh, marks you as, a, as an artist of special variety. <laughs> now, you came back after singing, you're making your debut in opera in 1930, and uh, David Belasco got you involved in something, I believe. No. Uh, um, Tell me I'm wrong. Just before I went to Europe, mm -hmm. just before I went to sing Tosca, David Belasco, who was, I was under contract to George Tyler, mm -hmm. and... Um, I had begged her Charlie to let me out of my five-year contract with him, because mm -hmm. from Brady I'd gone to Tyler. And uh, it was finally arranged. But I did go back and do play for him, Diplomacy, all-star cast of Diplomacy, while I was studying still with Madame. And um, the, the, uh, we sailed for Europe. Blasco sent for me, I'm digressing, just before, gave me the script of Night and the Other and said, would you please I want you to play this. And that I'd never been with him. This was the play before. Tonight or Never, right? Tonight or Never, yeah. And of course, in those days, to be asked by Belasco to be a star in one of his plays, it, it, people usually jumped at it. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I can't do that. Well, I said, first of all, I don't like the play. That's the first thing. I think it's pretty, pretty tawdry. And uh, no one will leave it. And, well, anyway, unless you have just the people right for it. 
it has to be the right man. He said, of course, but that's what I do. Always get the right person <laughs> for the leading man. And uh, uh, he said, uh, you'll sing in it, and that'll be marvelous. People hear you sing. I said, no, no, they're going to hear me sing in Europe in opera, the real thing. I didn't study all these months and, you know, all day long and all night uh, it, at the piano, not singing, but uh, in order to just sing a few songs and an area in, 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 in a play. And uh, so I went to Europe. And it was on in 29 or 30, mm -hmm. I've forgotten now. I think 30. 30, the second year that I went over there. I came back home and then went over again in 30. And I was singing Tosca in Vienna. I was alone. I'd left my teacher in Italy with her daughter. Her daughter lived in Europe and gone alone to, to Vienna. And so after the opera was over, everybody clapped. It was a terrible night with the wind howling. And my train, you know, stood out. And they talk about it in the, in the review. Stood out black. But anyway, for some miraculous reason, my voice went front. <laughs> and um, um, I came into the hotel. And the concierge gave me a cablegram. And then it said, it was for my brothers. And they said, do you want your father alive? Come home at once. Well, I went wandering the streets, and a kind Samaritan who thought I was trying to commit suicide or something, rather, I stopped at a bridge and look, looked over a uh, man, who I didn't know who it was, just a stranger, said, Fräulein, what is the matter? Can I help you? And I said, leave me alone, leave me alone. My father's dying. 